They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-15 Wednesday, February 23rd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And nothing snarky today. It's 65 degrees in New York City. So I'm in a great mood. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And in light of what Joe just said, yeah, you know, let's let's just all be happy and because, you know, that's that's the theme of the day. All right. Beautiful day here. That will be the theme Jersey. of the day. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I'm happy because because of the recent ruling, my horse Helium has now moved up to seventh place in all the right. Kentucky Derby. <laughs> so I can honestly say that I had a horse that finished seventh in the Kentucky Derby. You, Nothing wow. beats that, guys. You could probably stand him somewhere now. now I probably could have, but didn't, we didn't yell them. If we didn't gel them, we probably could have stood them somewhere. But, you know, Sons of Ironicus, I mean, you'd be amazed at how many people were excited. But they all said he had to have finished seventh or better in the Kentucky Derby. Eighth just doesn't do it for our breeders. You got to wait. You always got to wait to, to gel, John, until the last possible second. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Mark your calendars for the April Horses of Racing Age sale after the races on closing day of the spring meet, which is Friday, April 29th. Entries open Tuesday, March 1st. So a huge news week, lots to talk about. The biggest news of the week obviously came out Monday when we finally saw the white smoke from the conclave of the KHRC. That they had finally made a decision um, on the Kentucky Derby of 2021. Medina Spirit, as we anticipated, will be disqualified or has been disqualified uh, due to his bad methadone positive. Bob Baffert has also been suspended 90 days by the KHRC, which I don't think we were necessarily expecting. Um, so, you know, I, I expect Bob Everett and, and his lawyers to sue right away. That's kind of how this goes. Like, God forbid you ever just take it on the chin and be like, I broke a rule. Let's just move on. But he's, he's got a, he's got an interest in getting the horse, his horses into the Derby in the next couple of months. So I think that's going to be a big part of it. Uh, what do you guys think? What's, what's your, your read on the, on the suspension and the decision and what's next? Uh, Joe, nothing that was really unexpected here. I mean, I don't think most people, and I, I, if I speak, if I don't speak for the three of us, let me know, uh, thought that anything would happen other than uh, the horse would be taken down by the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission and the stewards. Uh, the 90-day suspension of Baffert, I didn't necessarily see that coming, but then if you look in the rules, um, they have a sliding scale for each offense. It starts and it goes like uh, zero to 10, 10 to whatever. And they recorded this as Baffert's fourth drug offense within the last 365 days, which is what came up with a 90 day penalty. But, you know, all that really was accomplished this week is we got through a step so that we can move on to the next step. And then after that, we're going to move on to the next step and then the next step, et cetera. Obviously, they've already said they're going to appeal this, the Baffert camp. Uh, they're going to take it to um, an administrative law judge, uh, which and, and later on in the show, we have a terrific interview with uh, attorney uh, uh, who's going to explain a lot of the uh, the minutia of this and how it works. But, you know, th this thing. It, it's funny too. I'm gonna uh, back up. Churchill Downs couldn't rip down that um, uh, Medina Spirit won a Kentucky Derby sign fast enough. I mean, they they, they yanked that down, put Mandaloon up there. So you know, they didn't ha they didn't say anything to the effect, but their actions spoke louder than words. But you know what? Uh, it, this is going to last a long time. I looked up what happened with Dancer's Image. The only other time this has ever happened in the history of the Kentucky Derby. It took about four years for this to be decided. So. Buckle in, uh, buckle up. It's going to be a long, bumpy, sometimes mind numbing. You want to, you know, scream ride, but nothing of, of any uh, real, I, I think, anything earth shattering. Um, the suspension in and of itself will keep Baffert out of all three Triple Crown races, uh, but he's going to obviously get a stay of that. And, and uh, you know, whether or not Churchill and Naira will let him run is, is another matter. And guys, I think one of the things that is a takeaway for me about this whole process is a they threw the book at him they gave him a 90-day suspension which was the maximum number of days that they could give him um seventy five hundred dollar fee it's 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 nominal in the grand scheme of things but it was it was the days it's the days that he's gonna have to sit out of racing um and that he may have to have the horses you know out of the barn under uh, without his you know signage and without uh, under under his under his watch um, based on the fact that it is that long of a window of a period of time where he has to be out. 
Um, and, and I think the other takeaway from this is that the three of us, when we speak to people, you know, when we speak to people outside the business, inside the industry, and even amongst ourselves, you know, pre and, and during the show, one thing that we've been very consistent about, and that is none of us feel that Medina Spirit had anything that helped his performance. It wasn't a matter of, of you know, whether it was a cream or an injector. It, it doesn't matter. That's not why he hit the wire first in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. And, you know, I honestly think that this was this was actually the right, 100 percent the right decision, I, you know, in terms of the DQ. In terms of the suspension, I think that's about you know as as much as as hard as they could have gotten him. Only problem is it took nine and a half months, almost ten months to get to this point. Like that was the issue. Now we'll see. Like the KHRC released like a, a statement in the past couple of weeks talking about that they're dedicated to more transparency going forward. I hope so, man, because this was not a good look that this took this long. But at the end of the day, they 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 came to the right decision. Is uh, Medina Spears now the third horse? to ever get DQ'd from a derby win. Bill mentioned Dancer's Image before it was the other one from a drug positive. And of course, a couple of years ago, Maximum Security for the interference. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, this is, I, again, I just I wish Bob Baffert would just take it on the chin one time and be like, all right, I'll go away for 90 days and I'll come back. Like, it's not like you're gonna lose all your owners. If the derby thing isn't gonna do it, 90 days isn't gonna do it either. And it's just, you know, it was just obviously this en endless litigation to come um, from all of these things. but. I think it really puts the squeeze on him in terms of getting into the Derby. I, I, I read the transcript of you guys' interview with our guest, um, and one of the interesting things that, that he said was that that time it's kind of been a time crunch now for Bob Baffert and his owners to try to get into the Derby, and he's surprised that there hasn't been any formal lawsuit uh, put forth by, by Craig Robertson or anybody against Churchill Downs. So I don't know. I just think this puts the screws to him a lot more now that it's, it's a regulatory suspension. It's not just an individual uh, corporation making a, a decision. He's he's suspended in the state of Kentucky. Um, so I don't know. It's, it seems to me like this is going to come to a head very soon in terms of getting horses into, horse into the derby. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Keeneland. We mentioned earlier that the Keeneland April sale returns April 29th and, and uh, entries open starting next Tuesday, March 1st. Uh, also, the Keeneland Spring Meet. Returns April 8th through the 29th. New Keeneland Select accounts that wager $300 in the first 30 days earn $100 back with their sign-up bonus. Visit KeenelandSelect.com to sign up. Might have a little bit of an announcement in the future relative to this show and the Keeneland Spring Meet, but we'll keep that under wraps for now. For now. As always, we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. The Eclipse Awards are a recognition of greatness. And the Eclipse Award goes to Corniche. Wow, how sweet it is. But Marla thought she was a breath of fresh air. And a special thank you to Echo Zulu. Jackie's Warrior. Spectacular horse. We're grateful for them. They win Horse of the Year, Nick Sko, 2021. It has been an incredible journey. Such an important award. Congratulations, each of you, on this amazing accomplishment. He was just put together like a machine, and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore, Cafe Pharaoh, son of American Pharaoh, won his second grade one February stakes in Tokyo on Sunday, becoming the first horse in history to do so. He earns an automatic berth into the Breeders' Cup Classic, never too early to think, start thinking about the Breeders' Cup with the win. American Pharaoh is now the fourth leading general sire in North America, so off to a great start. Um, this year, and over in Dubai, Shahama by Munnings took her record to four for four with a win in Friday's grade three UAE Oaks, definitely a Kentucky Oaks contender. The half-sister to Coolmore Stallion looking at Lucky was bred by SF Bloodstock and brought $425,000 at last year's will be a spring sale from the Eddie Woods consignment. She's now the fifth stakes winner for Munnings already this year. So this was a story last week that kind of immediately invalidated everything we talked about on the podcast about this. It's a love when that happens. The stories come out right after we record. Um, but we, we talked last week about the uh, the bill going through the Kentucky legislature to try to circumvent the 140 mayor cap that the jockey club was looking to institute. And right after that came through the, to the Ag Committee, the Jockey Club pulled the plug and said, we don't want that smoke. We're going to get rid of this 140 mayor thing. And I think it's the right call. I'm honestly surprised. And it's uh, it's so gratifying that they didn't 
have a hundred lawsuits to try to <laughs> try to negate this bill, considering everything that goes on in this industry with all the constant lawsuits and legal drama. So I applaud the Jockey Club for that. But I was a little surprised at how quickly they, they backed off on this. What do you guys think? Well, Joe, you know, it's funny. They put out in their press release, we're doing this uh, because this is not a time in the industry when people should be fighting. It should be all about unity. Well, come on. You did it because... 24 hours earlier, uh, this Kentucky legislature did something that was going to pass and was going to not only get rid of the 140 mayor cap, but, you know, really uh, damage the jockey club quite a bit. Could you imagine them no longer being the registry for Kentucky bred horses? You know, what a, a mess that would have been. I'm actually going to just throw it to John because, you know, he's the, he's the more the guy. I mean, someday maybe he's going to own the next Into Mischief and, uh, and, and, and see what his feelings are on, on that. But, um, yeah. I guess at the very least, we don't have to be talking about the uh, all the lawsuits for the next two, two and a half, three years about this. Take it. Yeah. And, and Bill, I, I've always been very outspoken about my feelings uh, about the 140 mare cap, um, you know, with regard to it should really be up to the breeders and, and up to supply and demand. Um, I mean, that, that's really what, what built the country and built and builds businesses um, is, you know, the ability to, to have the people who are writing the checks, the breeders make the decisions as to whom they want to breed uh, their mares to. And I understand that genetic studies came out and I understand that, you know, depending on who was reading it, um, it could be skewed. The message could be skewed or spun one way or the other. Um, certainly, I do believe that uh, the gene pool is shrinking and we need to address it. Um, whether or not the cap would have helped it or um, having, instead of having a hard cap, having incentivization to bring new gene pools into the, the, the breeding pool here, um, it, you know, it, would, would that have been a better system? Um, I personally think so, but I don't know how, how, you know, the ability of being able to do it. The bottom line is I'm glad that, um, that we don't have to have this rule kind of hanging over our head, um, and that we can kind of move forward as an industry, uh, in unity and in lockstep. Do I believe that's the sole reason why the jockey club, uh, you know, pulled the plug on, on the 140 mayor cap roll? No way in hell. Does it matter to me? Not really. Um, because the bottom line is that we're going to be able to move forward as an industry and, uh, you know, let the breeders decide if they want to breed 140 or 150 or 200 or eight mares to uh, a stallion at any given time. Yeah, I mean, this was kind of an imperfect solution. I think that, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a gen geneticist, obviously. I don't I don't know the extent to which inbreeding is, is you know, causing infertility or, or like, uh, you know, it, unsoundness in horses over time. But I would just, you know, look at the, the declining foal crops and the, you know, the kind of increasing number of, of horses that certain stallions can breed to and think that it would be a problem long term. But this was just such a drastic reaction to that, I think, you know, considering horses can breed 250, you know, 250 mares in a season to bring it all the way down to 140, I thought was very, you know, gutsy by the jockey club to try to do that. And it just seemed like it was never, you know, the, 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 Power players in racing were never going to let that happen because it's not just the stallion and breeding industry. It's also the sales industry. You have fewer into, into, mischief, into mischiefs that go through the ring. You know, it's not good for any of the, the auction houses either. So it just it, it made sense that this was not going to end up being the law of the land. But it also just goes to show you how important it is to have a legislature on your side. Because that's the case in Kentucky, and it's not the case pretty much anywhere else in America where you have the legislature that has the interests of this, the racing and breeding interest, industry at the forefront of their minds at all at all times. And you know, I just wonder what what the, what better shape racing would be in across the country if we had some kind of legislative heft be, behind the reforms that we try to do. And that's what Heiser was, and now who knows what that's going to end up being. So. Um, so yeah, so so it, once this came through the Kentucky legislature, it seemed like the the 140 mayor uh, cap was on borrowed time, and that's that's when it ended up happening. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Now joining us is Brian Sanfratello, who's the executive uh, secretary of the PHBA. Uh, he's on to discuss the uh, the new two, the new stakes PA sired and PA bred stakes program uh, that's coming to Pennsylvania. It's something that other other states have done to some success in New York and Florida. So Brian, what what races are we starting with, and and what was the impetus for this new stakes program? Well, uh, we actually uh, contacted the uh, stallion principals in Pennsylvania and uh, had a little uh, meeting with them, and we wanted to ask them what was what they thought was the most important thing to get the um, PA sired program uh, moving more than it already was. 
uh, and uh, they had suggested the uh, um, two-year-old sired series, and uh, uh, we brought that back to the uh, racing committee uh, on the uh, PHBA board, and uh, um, they put it together, and um, and we're rolling it out now, and everybody's kind of excited about it. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining us. And it's interesting to uh, segue a little bit and look at uh, what's been going on with the Maryland Million for the last many years. Preference is given in there to Maryland um, sired horses. And a lot of really good Maryland breads uh, sometimes can't get in. Is this the wave of the future, do you think? I'm not saying excluding Pennsylvania breads who are not by Pennsylvania sires, but is this the wave of the future, not only for Pennsylvania, but for all states? You think where they're going to have programs where the horses uh, by sires in that state are going to get uh, better treatment or preference? Well, uh, in our case, uh, we cannot pay money out to a horse that's not a PA bred. So we didn't have any choice uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, doing that. Uh, but we felt that uh, if the horse is PA sired and PA bred, that it would uh, benefit uh, uh, our in-state uh, registered sires more. And, and Brian, with the upcoming two-year-old sales just around the corner, can you give us an idea, give our audience an idea of how many foals are actually eligible for the upcoming two-year-old races? Um, because I would think it's it's probably a small amount, which is which is a good thing for Pennsylvania. It means that the uh, supply demand that if there's less supply, that the demand is going to be higher. Right. We we have uh, approximately three hundred and forty um, registered uh, PA sire PA bred horses. We feel that we're you know we're going to uh, bring in a few more between now and uh, uh, when the races uh, start. Uh, but that's. Um, it's it's broken almost in half. I think it's uh, right now it's 162 Colts and 172 Phillies. Uh, so uh, we feel that um, uh, you know we'll we'll have enough uh, in the uh, you know in the races. Uh, and uh, this year, what we did was we said uh, we wanted to get it off with a bang. So there are no nomination fees, uh, no uh, entry fees, or no starter fees. Uh, we wanted everyone to. Uh, to be eligible to, uh, you know, to give a good, uh, a good showing. Just to give a quick rundown of the program, it's going to be $600,000 total in purses this year for PA, uh, bread and PA sired two-year-olds. There'll be two days uh, with two races on each day. First races in the series will be run on Pennsylvania Day at the races, which is August 22nd at Parks, which will be $200,000 $100, stakes at five and a half furlongs. And then one month later, they'll be running for $200,000 each on the Pennsylvania Derby Day card. September 24th at a distance of six and a half furlongs. I just wanted to check if this is going to expand beyond the two-year-olds. Is that the plan going forward? Well, um, we, want to, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, when we do something, uh, we want to make sure that it definitely uh, can continue into the future. We don't want to do something for one year and have to stop it. So we're going to start with the two-year-old program and see how this goes. Next year, the two-year-old program will expand to three races. Um, uh, there'll be 125, 150, and 200,000. Um, so uh, we, we want to make sure that this, uh, you know, goes well before we do expand it to anyone else. And guys, I don't know if you, if you realize, but in the state of Pennsylvania, there are sons of Hardspun, Uncle Mo, Warfront standing uh, in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, I think for everyone's consideration, especially with the upcoming breeding season, you know, just starting off right now, um, that people should be looking at these stallions and uh, and seeing if they can, you know, have Pennsylvania sired, Pennsylvania bred horses to be eligible for races like this and year-round racing in the Keystone State. Definitely. Yeah, a lot of opportunity in Pennsylvania as well. Brian, thank you so much for coming on with us and talking to us, and best of luck with the program in 2022. Thank you very much, guys. All right, good to talk to you. We'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting edge research at Penn Vet into equine health and safety. And we endorse the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. Green Group 
guest of the week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So yesterday, Bill and John talked to Bob Hellringer, who is an equine regulatory law expert. God knows we need one of those these days. It was, a, it was a definitely an interesting interview. Um, so check out our interview, uh, Bill and John's interview with Bob. Our guest this week is Bob Hellringer, and what an appropriate time for him to make his debut here on the TDN Writers Room podcast, because right now, if you're not a lawyer, it's hard to cover this sport, because <laughs> we're not talking a lot about who won the Risen Star Stakes on Saturday. Unfortunately, we've been talking about, and have so for the last two years, all the lawsuits, the scandals, et cetera. And Bob, perhaps more so than anyone else, is an expert in that field. He's an attorney, and he literally wrote the book, Equine Regulatory Law. Bob Hellinger, thanks for joining us. And I'll start off with what I think is the, you know, the question that that I keep asking myself and I don't really have an answer for. So in the Baffert case, his attorneys are saying that the uh, medication, bethamethasone, got into the horse through an ointment and not an, uh, uh, not a, from an injection. Does that matter? It seems that the Kentucky stewards have said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it got into the horse's system. Your take on that? Well, I don't think it's going to ever matter to the regulatory people, uh, beginning with the stewards, uh, going to the racing commission, uh, where this case is, will be heading now. Uh, the, the racing commission here in Kentucky will probably appoint some kind of hearing officer and that person will hear all the proof, make a recommendation to the commission. And, and I don't think anybody thinks that, uh, there's going to be any other outcome, but that they will uphold the stewards. Um, and then it gets to court, uh, there, they might have a chance with that theory. The, the, the reviewing court doesn't hear the case all over again. Uh, it's not what they call a de novo hearing, but it's um, uh, they just review the record and they see if the underlying decision was based on what's called substantial evidence. And there is a real term of art. OK, substantial evidence to one judge might mean something different to another judge. But both of the circuit judges in Franklin County, uh, one of them is going to get this case. And they're both very well respected in administrative law circles. They both practiced in this area before they were judges. They've dealt with cases involving the, the Racing Commission in dozens of times. They have ruled against the Racing Commission a number of times. Uh, uh, more frequently, they've upheld them. But uh, the uh, Baffert team will get, uh, I think, a much more objective hearing in court than they're going to get at the uh, regulatory level. And, and Bob, one of the things that, that came out um, as far as why Bob Backard got a 90-day suspension versus a 60-day suspension is the fact that he's had a number of four or five positives over the past calendar year. Can you explain to our audience why that is so impactful in, in the decision and the penalty? Well, there's a, a scale of penalties. Uh, the, the severity of the penalties goes up with uh, its... It's almost, God, I hate to make this comparison to our beloved sport, but it's almost like a, a pers persistent felony offender statute in criminal law, which most states have. If you keep committing felonies uh, and the prosecutor can continue to double the sentence of the subsequent felonies that you either plead guilty to or are found guilty of. And so there's a similar scale. Uh, for racing uh, penalties for violations if you've been a frequent offender. And and so uh, Mr. Baffert is not just someone starting out with a first offense type case. And so that's reflected in what the stewards um, have imposed. Bob, I want to get back to the, the first question I asked and, and get you to elaborate a little bit more on this, because you know to me, this is this is the entire defense of the Baffert team. They're not saying he didn't have the drug in their system. They're saying, yeah, he had it in the system, but um, you have to understand there's extenuating circumstances. Um, I would like to think this thing is in black and white. Um, don't the rules of the Kentucky Racing Commission say if you have a prohibited medication in you, you will be 
the horse will be disqualified and the trainer will likely be suspended. In any way, shape or form, does it say, well, if you have one that's really bad, you might get suspended. But if you have one that's kind of innocuous, it's not such a big deal. I would like to think at the end of the day, this would be, again, just something in black and white. But, but you seem to think that's not the case. Well, the regulatory side of this is different than the judicial side, in my opinion. The regulatory side tries to have it in the starkest colors uh, with no room for prevarication or obfuscation, uh, one of those words. Um, uh, so to prevent, uh, you know, these cases bogging down in, in um, the minutia of of trying to, to tweak or get a, get away from the absolute uh, part of the rule. They, they try to enforce that uniformly and uh, not on a case-by-case -case basis. So it, it almost doesn't matter if this had happened to Bob Baffert or Bob Smith or Bob Hellringer uh, in a race where you're the trainer of record. If you have the record he has and you have this positive finding, uh, you're going to get the same uh, penalty and the same uh, disqualification as as anybody else. So uh, it's only when it moves to the judicial uh, forum, I think, that there's a possible chance uh, to show some kind of um, um, prevarication, for lack of a better word, that that why the rules should not strictly apply. And they'll base that on due process grounds that that uh, here's what the rule is meant to prevent. And but you're violating his rights if you take it to the absolute level that the regulatory people have. So um, that's an argument that both of these uh, circuit court judges in Frankfurt will at least listen to. Um, but how they rule, of course, is uh, another matter entirely. And, and Bob, one of the other things that we talk about all the time is, was you know, when when Naira and Churchill Downs both came out and said that they were um, giving uh, the ba Bafford at all a two year suspension. And we've gone back and forth as to again, we're lay people, but we've gone back and forth as to whether or not those organizations have the right to impose such uh, a lengthy stay uh, on, on Bob Bafford. What's the legal angle on it? How can they do that? Well, Back in, in the day when racing's regulatory people, stewards and racing commissions were all powerful, uh, you had federal courts that that even held that uh, black letter law that racetracks had an inherent right. That was the word they used. Racetracks had an inherent right to admit or exclude anybody they wanted for any reason, uh, not connected to what they call constitutional ground. You can't exclude somebody because they're Catholic or a woman, you know, et cetera. So, or even a Republican, although they were close <laughs> on the Republican. But uh, anyway, um, no, uh, racetracks have a lot of leeway, but that has changed considerably over the years since the 1940s and 50s. Uh, uh, there's been a number of states, West Virginia is one that comes to mind readily, where uh, there have been cases that say that, that um, licensees in particular have a due process right to be heard. They, they can't just be unilaterally ejected for no reason whatsoever. So uh, that's why Mr. Baffert won the first round up in New York, because they ejected him and barred him from entering horses without a hearing. And the federal court said un under the, the Supreme Court case that came out 40 years ago, Barry versus Barchi, that all equine lawyers know is the uh, is the gospel. Uh, you're entitled to a hearing and due process. So uh, they did have their hearing and they haven't had a result yet from that hearing. But uh, so it is it is changed. It It's a person has a chance today to overturn uh, just such an ejection, depending on where you are, what state you're in, what your judicial branch has done in the past. It varies like everything else in racing. Dep depends on what which of the 38 racing states you're in as to how really you're going to get dealt with in this situation. Uh, Bob, if he hasn't already, uh, by the time we're recording this, uh, I'm sure Baffert will get a stay of his suspension, the 90-day suspension. So that won't be an issue for him trying to run in the Kentucky Derby. But as John mentioned, there is the other matter of Churchill Downs banning him. We're only a little bit more than two months away from the Kentucky Derby. 
What do you think the chances of Baffert being able to race horses in the Derby are? And what will be the plan of attack for his lawyers going forward to make that happen? Well, right now, his chances are zero. I mean, he I'm, I'm kind of um, perplexed, like I guess some other people are, that he hasn't uh, filed such a challenge yet. Um, and maybe that's forthcoming, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. And time is dwindling. So uh, I don't know if he's most of his owners, it looks like, have stayed with him. Uh, but these horses aren't, uh, they're winning significant races, but they're not racking up any points. Uh, Churchill Downs is resolute. They're not going to run here. And so um, at some point, he's going to have to uh, seek judicial intervention of some kind if he wants to actually do that. And, uh, and then, then it's going to get very interesting. Bob, let me let me shift gears on you for a second and, and talk about another rule that was that was implemented and now has been removed, and that was 140 mare cap that the jockey club had implemented, and and now those uh, those words have actually been removed from from the rules. Is it was it within the jockey club? In your opinion, was it within the jockey club's jurisdiction to try to implement such a rule? Oh, it may have been in their jurisdiction, but isn't it amazing the timing of that <laughs> announcement? Uh, the day after a bill was on the floor, it, it was t a day after it was introduced, it went through the Agriculture Committee and it was on the House floor the day, which is as fast as you can legally move a bill in the legislature, um, that was going to prohibit such ac action. And um uh, I'm sure that timing was of that announcement was purely coincidental, but um, <laughs> I, I think they would have a very hard time um, defending that in court. I mean, well, not, they wouldn't have a hard time defending it, but a hard time winning the a defense of that that act. I guess they were just hoping nobody would challenge it. And there were lots of people in Kentucky that were ready to challenge that, but I guess they just thought they'd pass a bill. We got the Speaker of the House here, who's a, a thoroughbred owner, breeder, you know, and um, uh, very interested in that issue. Let's just leave it at that. Bob, let's turn our attention to horse racing's other favorite miscreants, Mr. Uh, Service and Navarro. Um, Navarro uh, will be sentenced to, uh, well, has been sentenced to five years in prison, waiting to see where what prison he goes to. But Jason Service is still out there fighting this thing. And again, I'm a layman, but I look at this and see a guy who is, must be spending astronomical amounts in legal fees and doesn't appear to have any chance whatsoever. Again, that's that's I'm not a legal scholar, but I have followed this this uh, case fairly closely. I, I I make him 501 in the morning line to to, to win this case. Um, <laughs> Maybe even part the, of the field. Yeah, remember I'm that. The federal court. You used to have the so, field. Are you are you surprised that he is fighting this to the extent he is? And all, am I wrong? Does is there some some way magically he can can win this at, at trial? Well, first of all, you you began your question with uh, that he must be paying astronomical legal fees. We certainly hope that that's true. <laughs> uh, but other than that, um, uh, Drew Malika has one of those defendants, so I know he would appreciate me saying that. Uh, New York lawyer. The um, you know I don't know. They're they're all individual cases. I'm not privy to what's the negotiating, I'm sure there's negotiating going on just like there was with Navarro and uh, Navarro just came to an agreement sooner. Uh, that doesn't mean that service won't, but they, uh, they're they holding out and uh, making the prosecutor think they're going to have to try the case. And there, there's that give and take when you're negotiating a plea that um, that you hope that, that they'll give you a little better deal if you give up you know, your right to trial and save them the time and expense of doing that. So so we don't know uh, what's going on or what the evidence is. It looks like the evidence is kind of the same for both of them, the wiretaps, et cetera, but, um, and the other witnesses that are willing to testify against them. So I think at some point there'll be a plea reached, but uh, you never know. Bob, when you're teaching equine law at University of Louisville, what when, when the students come in and they and they go over the syllabus and they go over the chapters in your book, what is most interesting for them? What were they really looking to to learn about equine law? 
Well, I was, I was going to say that most of them want to know what it's going to take to pass. Uh, that's <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah, it's an elective at U of L when I teach it, and and so kids that are in there want to be in there, which is a very different type type of class. Uh, I taught the class one year for the undergraduate. Uh, business school. U of L has one of the, like the University of Arizona does, has this equine business uh, major that you can have. And I used to teach over there, uh, but I taught it like a law school class. But anyway, one year the dean decided to make this a, a mandatory class. So I had like 30 kids in there, about 24 of whom did not want to be in there. And it was, uh, it's just a very different um uh, atmosphere. I'll put it that way. They, um, the, those 24 just are getting through it. And the other ones are all pumped up. They love it. They're, they ask a lot of questions. And, and so, uh, most of my kids, there's, there's, I've had one that's uh, now a judge. And I say, whenever I'm in her court, I say, I know you, you used this equine law class you took for me. And that that's helping you every day in this, in this courtroom. And she says, yes, it sure is. Um, and smiles. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just hope they enjoy the subject matter. Uh, my textbook is more like a history book. Uh, as my granddaughter t uh, told me one time, it has pictures in it and um, profiles of people. And I, I didn't want it to be like a law book I had in law school, which were mostly boring uh, case law studies. And, and um, I have a lot of history in there and I try to make it interesting. I have some a weak attempts at humor at various points in the book. Uh, I find humor in try to find it in everything. So um, even I've struggled to do it even here with this uh, <laughs> uh, serious subject. But anyway, it's something I, I enjoy teaching. And, and I think most of the kids have given me pretty good reviews. And and uh, but but you have all got a new dean about three years ago. And all of a sudden uh, I was not asked back. So if the new dean is listening, uh, I'd sure like to to teach it again. So anyway, well, shame on that new dean. will have to. Uh, yes. <laughs> and he's from New on. York. Oh, yes. Yeah, he, well, he knows racing. Go. Yeah. Uh, Bob, I've got one more on service in Navarro. Um, OK. The, well, another one of the great unanswered questions to me is when this thing first happened, it looked to be a situation where they could go to the guys that were selling this stuff. And cut deals with them and say, tell me who else you were selling to. We know about service. We know about Navarro. Give me the list of the rest of your clients that were buying the performance enhancing drugs. That has never happened. Um, the, the whole case is just stuck to the original people indicted way back in March 2020. Why do you think that is that they it would seem to be like low hanging fruit to go after maybe even dozens of more trainers? Why do you think that hasn't happened? And could it still happen? Well, it could still happen. Uh, they're, they're not going anywhere. There's, uh, in most states, there's no statute of limitations on felonies. So uh, they may be waiting to see if they wrap up all these big people and, and they get some serious time and then, then they'll go after the low hanging fruit, as you call them. So uh, there's, there's no rush. They, they obviously intended to put the, the two big people out of business and get them off the racetrack. Uh, as quickly as possible and, and with some other co-defendants in there, but uh, they, they still can uh, and probably will pursue other people before it's all over. Unfortunately, which means we get to read about it, you know, for the next five years. And right. Well, we want to thank Bob Hellringer for coming on and Bob, I should have gone to law school. You guys are the ones no, making all the money no, right you now. Shouldn't with have. What's going no. on in horse racing? What You'll was have I think a normal the world life. Yes. Okay. No. Anyways, Bob, uh, thanks so much for your time, and we appreciate you appearing sure. as the Green Group Guest of the Week here on the TDM Writers right. Podcast. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Bob Hellringer, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. 
Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. XBTV's workout of the week this week is Cabo Spirit, who was last seen running second to Messier in the Robert B. Lewis Stakes, worked a sharp five furlongs in one minute and three-fifths at Santa Anita on Sunday, which you can see. The winner of the Eddie Logan Stakes in his prior start is a, is a $575,000 OBS spring two-year-old, is trained by George Papa Pedromo, definitely a little under-the-radar contender for the Derby Trail. So we had some very nice racing on Saturday at Fairgrounds. I thought it was a terrific, terrific card. Really kept me engaged on a Saturday. You know, in the off season, it's like kind of wait for the spring and the summer to really just sit down and watch the races all day. But I was I was I was tuned into that Fairgrounds card. Big race, obviously, was the Risen Star. Um, unfortunately, I you know once Epicenter got clear in that race, it was just yet another race that felt like it was kind of over before. You know, the real running began. I thought Smile Happy ran well to be second. Uh, Zandon also ran pretty well from the back of the pack in there. But Epicenter is a very, very fast horse. He was a tough luck loser in the Lecompte after setting that fast pace. Um, and definitely a very nice horse for, for Steve Asmussen. Uh, what do you guys think of the Risen Star? Uh, Joe, the New Orleans route to the Derby has, uh, by and large, over the years, not produced really much of anything or, or not anything in the way of Derby winners. Um, that might change. This was a very full field of a lot of good horses in there. And, uh, you know, going one by one, uh, Epicenter, I agree. I, I mean, he obviously is, is a legitimate Derby contender. Uh, Steve Asmussen is so overdue to win the Kentucky Derby. I mean, he's going to win three or four before it's all over. And, and you know, is it going to be this year? But as I wrote in my weekend review, uh, you know, I, I thought the star of the show, Smile Happy, even though he got beat two and three quarter lengths or two and a half or what it was. The, the way the race developed, like you said, um, into the first turn, Epicenter got away from those horses. The race, for all practical purposes, was over. Smile Happy at that point uh, was eighth or ninth, something like that. Corey Lannery was never able. It was not so much that he was steadying or, or, or bothered, but he was always sort of hemmed in between horses. He couldn't find a lane. At the top of the stretch, it looked hopeless, like he might finish fifth or something like that. He made a, a good late run to get up for second. I, it, I thought it was a huge race for him. And Zanon also in third ran very well. I didn't think he ran quite as well as Smile Happy, but he hopped a little bit of the start. Also had a, a, a trip where he was uh, pretty far back behind a slow pace. So I think all three horses stamp themselves as very legitimate contenders for the Kentucky Derby. Um, I think Smile Happy in defeat to me showed that he's the best of the bunch. Uh, but we'll find out. I guess they'll all go to the Louisiana Derby now uh, next. And uh, it, it will be maybe a year where the Louisiana roots, the Derby, does in fact uh, prove to be productive. Well, one of the reasons why we decided to have our uh, Kentucky Derby contest a couple of weeks early was specifically because the way this race was setting up, um, we actually selected there were six different horses out of the 10 that were selected in our contest. And not that that's the be all or end all, but it shows the strength top to bottom of the race. Um, and Bill, I think Epicenter was like your fourth round pick. I mean, that, that's, that's how strong, you know, we thought of some of the contenders and, and, you know, in the, in the field and uh, specifically and, and in this crop. Um, it, I would, I would say that Epicenter to me looked a little bit more legitimate than, than I think, you guys are, are are giving him credit for. I know you both said that, that he looks like a definite contender, but let's just play it out. He he, you know, went to the lead twenty three and four. These were his splits for for every quarter of the race. So his first quarter was twenty three and four. Next quarter was twenty four and one. He again matched that for the four furlongs to, to six furlongs, twenty four and one. 
the six furlongs to a mile, 24 and two. And he finished up in kind of in a handwriting 12 seconds, uh, you know, 12 and two fifth seconds. So he was consistently, you know, kind of hammering out uh, every single quarter mile. And that's not an easy thing to do. So I, I really, uh, you know, give him a lot of credit. And again, shame on me and, and the rest of us for, for not selecting Epicenter earlier in, in our, you know, in our most important contest. Um, but as soon as the gates opened and, and, and Rosario decided to send him to the front, he did. And then he just kept clipping off very consistent quarters, um, which is not an easy thing at, at this stage of the game. The other ones you mentioned, Smile Happy ran a phenomenal race also. And, and again, coming off a layoff from Thanksgiving. So that, that's an important kind of shake the rust off kind of race in the all important Kentucky Jockey Club that we've spoken about, just the strength top to bottom of, of, of that prep as a two year old. Zandon and, and even Pioneer of Medina also put in great runs and, you know, will be contenders for the Louisiana Derby. I was a little disappointed in Papa Cap. Um, and I know, you know, Bill, you begrudgingly picked Papa Cap, I think, at the end of, of the of the of the draft and was kind of like, well, I guess he's a contender. Um, I mean, he was still four to one in the morning line and, and just never really got off, uh, you know, got into the race at all. Maybe it was from the one hole. Maybe he's just not quite good enough um, now that some of these other three-year-olds are developing. Um, but again, top to bottom, really strong race. I think we'll be looking back at this race in particular as a key race um, for the road to the Kentucky Derby. 98 buyer for Epicenter, son of not this time, stands at Taylor Made and Keeneland graduate. Bringing it all together, John, for us as always. Um, I, yeah, I think that the top three all, all ran very well for, for different reasons. Um, just to run down the points, we had the super in, in the TDN Derby contest. So uh, Bill gets 50 points uh, with Epicenter, and I get 20 with uh, Smile Happy. Al gets 10 with Zandon, and Sue completing the Super at 33 to 1 with Pioneer of Medina gets five points um, with uh, Pioneer of Medina. So all four of us on the board to start the contest. That's, that's what you like to see here. But one of the things I thought was interesting about you know what you've seen so far in terms of the Derby preps, the major – Derby preps that we've had so far. To me, there's been four, and all four of them have been won by horses on or right near the lead with speed. So we had Messier in the Bob Lewis. We had White of Barrio in the uh, Holy Bull. Now, last week, we had Classic Causeway shaking off a lot of pace pressure to win the the uh, Sam Davis. And then we have Epicenter going wire to wire in the Risen Star. So that's it's going to be a little interesting to watch that develop as prep season goes on if we end up having like – seven, eight, nine horses that you think would want the lead in the Derby could lead to a, to a Monarco situation, but you know, obviously still a long way to go, but then it's, it's definitely something to watch. Um, we will talk about the, the, a couple other races on the fairgrounds card. I know John wants to talk about the Rachel Alexandra, which was upset by a, a Brad Cox horse. I wanted to talk about Olympiad. You know, I am the, I, I am the, the card carrying member of the Olympiad fan club, the first or the original, the, the, the creator of the Olympiad fan club. But he is super, super nice. And I don't care. He only got a 102 buyer, quote unquote, only. I don't care what the number is. The way he finishes these races, he came home in under 30 seconds for the last 516. He came home in 29.53 seconds, which is kind of unheard of on dirt in a two-turn race to come home that fast. He set a new track record at Fairgrounds, ran 142 flat um, in the mine shaft, winning by two and a quarter lengths. Now, obviously, he got a good setup. He was just, ju just off the speed of Silver Prospector, who was probably not good enough to win that race. But it wasn't a bad field. He had Miles D in there, Obesos, who we like. Uh, Midcourt is not a terrible horse. Entreaty, in, or untreated, rather, um, for Louis Saez and Todd Pletcher is a nice horse that I think is going to make some noise and maybe some smaller stakes this year. I love Olympiad. I think the sky's the limit for him. If you can get a Breeders' Cup Classic future somewhere, I think I would take a flyer on him, especially considering the likelihood that life is good and flight line are not going to make it all the way through the year and might be whisked off to the breeding shed. So I love Olympiad. Uh, John, what else did you think about the Rachel? Well, I thought the Rachel Alexandra was, you know, was an interesting race because we haven't really spoken a lot about the three-year-old fillies. And primarily we haven't spoken about them, uh, you know, A, because the Colts usually drive the bus, especially this time of year. But also there hasn't been that like really – top to bottom standout group of three-year-olds have been occasional um, standout performances, but nothing where you'd really go, wow, that's a horse, um, you know, other than like Nest or, or, or someone like that, where you go, wow, that, that's really, really impressive. And the way the race was supposed to set up was, you know, Lacrete, who was undefeated, daughter of Medallia Dioro, um, that, uh, that Stone Street would, you know, breeder owner, 
um, was supposed to go out and, and go to the lead and, and kind of keep going just like the way that the, that the, uh, the boy race, you know, ran. Um, and instead she got pulled up, you know, a half mile into it. And that really opened up the race for, for a couple of horses, um, that were a little bit off the beaten path and the winner turned her loose, uh, you know, for Brad Cox, it was his first time. It was her first time running on the dirt. Um, she had run four times on the turf and, uh, you know, won a half a million dollar race at, at Kentucky Downs and, uh, placed in the Jessamine, just got beat. Um, and, and basically the race opened up for her because LaCrete and Hidden Connection kind of ding donged on the front end and, uh, and, and it opened up for a horse that could sit off it, um, like Turner Loose. I thought it was an impressive race for Turner Loose. Um, you know, then we had Giles of Fire, a uh, daughter of Mineshaft who stands at Lane's End. Um, and, uh, and, and she was trying to, you know, to, to, uh, to compete against the, these top horses, ran a great second. And then Awake at Midnight, again, another daughter of Nyquist. Um, finishing third, and the sneaky race, sneaky performance in the race, I thought was uh, was Hidden Brook Farms horse, Hidden Connection, um, for Brett Calhoun, who you know went ding donging with Lacrete for the first you know three quarters of the race, hadn't run since the Breeders' Cup, and uh, just got nosed out for third, was was kind of you know shuffling her stride, mid, you know, with about a furlong to go down the stretch, but that's a filly that I think is under the radar with a lot of talent, Hidden Connection. Um, that is just knocking off the rust and getting ready to uh, to to improve as we're getting closer to the Oaks. So I think that the Philly races are starting to come and develop as well, and we'll see a couple of stars come Oaks Tech. Yeah, I mean, and that was that that was a really good race in, going into the race too. I thought you had four real top contenders. Uh, John mentioned uh, most of them. And Turner Loose is an interesting horse just because she she had her whole race uh, her whole career on turf. And it's not, I don't usually see Brad Cox horses do that. Like really, I mean, Mon Girl ran on turf once, but overall she was a dirt horse. Um, this is a horse that's been pretty highly touted. She was like six to five in that Keelan Jessamine race that, that uh, John was uh, referencing. But she's just, she seems to be a lot better on dirt. It's just, it's always interesting. These horses that run four or five times on turf and then just com be completely new horses um, on dirt as well. I just want to give a shout out to Joel Rosario on Lacrette. Now, John mentioned that she pulled up early in, the, in that race. He was very, very quick to pull her up and might have saved her life. She had a condylar fracture. She had surgery the other day. It sounds like she's going to be OK. Um, but that kind of quick thinking, quick hands from Joel Rosario can be the difference sometimes between a horse surviving an incident and not. So, so shout out to Joel for that one for sure. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. West Point had some action over the weekend. How about Cavalry Charge going wired, not quite wired to wire, but was up on the lead most of the way in the fairground stakes, going a mile and an eighth on turf and held on at 35 to 1. So a nice ride by Brian Hernandez Jr. and a big congratulation to the owners, West Point Thoroughbreds, as, as well as William Sandbrook and Rob Massiello. And also Obeso, who I thought ran a little bit of a sneaky fourth in the in the uh, mine shaft. We talked about Olympiad before. No one was ever going to beat him, but to, it was kind of a slow pace. So closed into a little bit of a, a dawdling, a little, little bit of dawdling fractions up front, ran fourth. So I think there's better things to come from him in his four-year-old year. And it's uh you know it's, it's sales season, John. So you, you have any have, have any notes about uh, West Point's upcoming sales season? Well, Joe, I mean the the, the uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, this is prime time to get some of the next top juveniles in the upcoming sales. And one of the things that I've always been impressed with West Point uh, and, and Terry Finley and his group is that they work those sales. They are there every day in the heat and the rain for the under tax shows. They're taking notes. They're clocking horses. Not only while they're going down the uh, stretch for the breeze, but in the gallop out, um, then they're doing the analytics and, and looking at the horses physically. I mean, it, it, there's, there's probably, I can't think of a group that does a more thorough job in uh, not only watching horses and vetting horses out at these two-year-old sales than, uh, than West Point Thoroughbred. So it's prime time to, uh, to get on board with the West Point Thoroughbred partnership because they're gonna be down in Miami and, and in Ocala over the next few weeks unearthing the next great horse that's going to wear the West Point thoroughbred cells. But he said I better myself, as you can see. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life 
make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy is now accepting entries for the summer yearling sales. Their 2022 sales calendar includes the basic tip in July horses of racing age sale, basic, basic tip in July yearlings, Saratoga, Saratoga, New York brands, as well as Keeneland, September. Call Tommy or Wendy at 859-609-4404 or visit LegacyBloodStockLLC.com. There's some big news earlier this week uh, on the front of disqualifications and interference. Oklahoma has become the first state in the union to uh, institute Category 1 interference rules. This is something that Pat Cummings and TIF have been pushing for for a long time. But I'll, I'll let Bill explain what it means. Well, Joe, I'll try to make what is complicated a little less complicated. There are two systems in the world for doing disqualifications, Category 1 and Category 2. Most countries in the world are Category 1. The United States is Category 2. Here's the difference. In our system, Category 2, if a horse bothers another horse and costs it in the steward's minds a placing, the horse that caused the infraction will be taken down. So, for instance, if um, Glowworm wins the race and at the 16th pole he sawed off Helium and Helium finished uh, fifth but might have finished third if not getting bothered, Glowworm would come down. In the Category 1 system, it the horse only comes down if the horse it bothered would have finished ahead of the horse. So back to, okay, so proven strategies is coming down the stretch and he saws off helium and they finish one, two, but proven strategies definitely would have finished behind helium or helium would have finished ahead of proven strategies. That therefore is a disqualification. I hope people can understand that. I know it's a little bit complicated. Now, um, I love Pat Cummings. I think the work that he's been doing is very important for the sport, but he's been the one guy out there that has been, um, you know, saying and, and over and over again, we've got to go to category one, got to go to category one. I hate this. I, I, am I alone here? This is for a lot of reasons. First of all, I think our system is better. First of all, if a, a horse is cost a placing, I think that that should result in a disqualification, both for the owner of the horse that was bothered and what about and for the betters. Now, you know, people aren't just betting to win. They're betting trifectas, superfectas, et cetera. You could have a horse that finishes fifth, was bothered and might have been fourth and got into your super. Maybe you would have hit the super for a thousand dollars, but now you're not going to get put up. In the Kentucky Derby, I think most people, uh, most sane people anyways, think that maximum security sh could, should have come down. Under this rule, he wouldn't have come down because the horses he bothered were not going to finish ahead of him. I thought that was one of the most obvious fouls and it, it, it happened in a big race. And also, too, I want, work, wonder about the jockeys. If, if a guy, Jockey X, is coming down the stretch and he, there's a hole and he knows if I go in there, I'm going to saw off horse Y, but at the end of the day, since horse Y is tiring a little bit, I'm not going to get disqualified. Um, is this a license for jockeys to ride? Uh, I, uh, I, I wouldn't say recklessly, but maybe take more chances than they would uh, normally. I don't. I, I think our system worked fine. I don't see the reason to change. And I hope Oklahoma is the one one system out there that that or one state out there that sticks to this. So, Bill, I'm just just clarify it for me because because I'm still a little confused on on the situation. Does, does this give the stewards more or less judgment calls when it comes to watching races? 
I, I think neither. I, I think it just changes what kind of judgment calls they have to make. Because again, back to category two, they have to use, I mean, there's no, there's no obvious, um, it's not like, you know, baseball, well, if three strikes, you're out, four balls, you, you walk. There's no obvious rule here, but in the category two, they have to decide whether or not the infraction costs the horse a placing. And that could be, you know, something that is, is, is not necessarily black or white, a gray area. Now they have to decide whether or not in Oklahoma, whether or not it costs the horse uh, uh, would have finished ahead of the other horse. It will result, I'm sure, in fewer disqualifications. But, you know, look, I, I mean, you know, people love to criticize the stewards every single time there's a disqualification. People, no matter how blatant it is, people are screaming on Twitter. This is the worst call I've ever seen in the history of horse racing. Then the same guy next week will say, this was the worst call I've ever seen in the history of horse racing. So, you know, again, John, yeah, uh, I don't think it's going to make it. Uh, the stewards are going to have to make it more decisions of that nature. I just think they're going to have to make different decisions. I've got a lot of a lot, a lot of opinions on this. I think, you know, it's in a way it's going to put more into the stewards hands in that. You know, if a horse gets gets bothered and then misses third by like a head or a nose, then it's a relatively easy thing, I think, to say that horse was cost of placing. If I bother you at the eighth pole and then run off and the horse tries to re-rally, but he still gets beaten by me by three lengths, who are you to say that that horse was or wasn't going to win that race, you know, with the contact happening so much earlier? It's just, it seems like it's going to be such a high bar to clear to say this horse who got picked off at the nine sixteenths pole was going to finish again oh, 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 ahead of this horse that you know did five other things from that point on in the race. I think it does lead to you know a little bit more incentivizing reckless riding because you know the the disincentive now to when you have a horse who's getting going and you don't have a lot of room the disincentive to just knocking horses side off you know one side or another that are retreating perhaps is that you can get DQ'd and put put behind that horse after the steward's inquiry like it 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 tells you that no horse is is sacrificeable in this pursuit to get a clear lane or or get through a hole um and i you know i just think it's it might lead to to fewer DQs but as as bill said this isn't just a game where you bet to win and it's not just a game where they pay out the purse to win they pay out sometimes all the way down to 5th 6th 7th so if you get bothered and you know they're going to say oh well you weren't going to beat the horse that won the race so what? I still was going to finish better than I would have before if that horse hadn't done that. So I just, I don't know, it's for me, it's a little bit of a solution in search of a problem. And I don't think, you know, I think the people, people's problems with stewards rulings is that they're inconsistent, is that there'll be the DQ for this one day and then they'll leave it up that day. That's just humans. You're not going to be able to change that. Just, just human judgment and human error. I don't know, even beyond having few, maybe fewer inquiries and fewer DQs, I don't know that this necessarily fixes the problem that people have when it comes to the, those sorts of things. That's never been my problem if I get like DQ'd out of stuff. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's yeah. never been like, oh, well, that horse wasn't going to finish ahead of me. So what? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, could you, I mean, again, if you imagine the Derby. Okay, so uh, Maximum Security almost killed Long Range Toddy or whoever the hell that horse's name was. But no, you know, Hot Range Toddy was never going to finish ahead of him. So go ahead, Luis. It's fine. Right, you you right. almost killed off like five or six different Yeah. yeah. So, but seriously, under this, under Cummings' rule, it, it, he wouldn't have come down. Right. And when I think would have been crazy. You know, it's just yeah. you cut off half the field. Who is a steward to say, you know, that horse wouldn't have re-rallied in the next five sixteenths and finished ahead of you? Like it's just completely seems like you it seems like you're putting more faith in the stewards to make these. Right. Well, that's, that's why I asked the question. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 Just mention this before we leave. Uh Marcus Vitali was back in the news, obviously, for the wrong reasons. Um, this past week. He got a one year suspension in, in Pennsylvania after one of his horses tested positive. For methamphetamine, uh, Bill's been covering this, and he, he ran into somebody who, uh, who thought that Marcus Vitale is getting railroaded. Free Marcus Vitale. B Bill, let's, let's hear that. Well, okay, so he, he gets the positive for meth in Pennsylvania, one-year suspension. It's the, the 1,408th suspension of his career or something like that. We all know that. Uh, I'm going to say something that's going to be incredibly unpopular here. But, Joe, uh, you know, and, and 
sticking up for Marcus Vitale is like sticking up for like Hannibal Lecter or something like that. Um, but, you know, you look at that. Did he really give methamphetamine to a horse and say, I'm going to, you know, put it in improved performance? Um, come on. No, that didn't happen. Meth is everywhere. You know, environmental con contamination, et cetera. Also, the Pennsylvania Racing Commission has not been consistent whatsoever. Uh, and all other methamphetamine positives, there's been basically no penalty whatsoever. Peter Miller got a methamphetamine positive in um, Pennsylvania and uh, uh, was only given a fine, no suspension whatsoever. So then the question is, are they uh, setting, uh, um, are they going by different standards because he is Marcus Vitale? Well, that's the maybe, thing. You, we, 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 talked, we talked about this before. Like John mentioned the Baffert 90 days. Right. Yeah. 90 day suspension. You wouldn't have got a 90 day suspension if it was this just this one thing. If there's one guy who has not earned the benefit of the doubt in horse racing, it's Marcus. No, yeah, to totally understood. And, you know, uh, the other part of the story here, and again, because, I, I, you know, oh my God, please don't anybody think I'm sticking up for this guy or vouching for him or something like that. But he, I mean, that he has not been thrown out of horse racing for good by every track in the country up to this point. Again, it's something, again, we've been talking about for two and a half years on here, just how ridiculous that is and what a black eye for the sport it is and shows how the sport is really not serious about cracking down on the rule breakers such as Marcus Vitale. So uh, is he going to have to serve a one-year suspension? Maybe, maybe not. They'll, I don't think he has the resources Bob Baffert has, but the, but he'll definitely fight this. And at some point in time, we'll get a, conc a conclusion. And even if he serves the one-year suspension, I'm sure Turf Paradise will roll out the red carpet for him uh, when he decides to come back there in, at the end of the suspension. You still got Carolyn Vogel in his corner too. Okay. There you go. Yes. About her. As, long as, you have, as long as you have a single... A dedicated, loyal owner. You can be. You can stick around in racing. She says in Bill's story that she will stick with by him until further notice. He's very good with legs, <laughs> very hands on. He doesn't have too many horses. He's not real expensive. I bet he makes it more affordable and fun. Is she concerned about his reputation? Bill asked. I don't think he's a cheater. He might push the envelope, but he doesn't cheat. Well, right. But, you, but doesn't that doesn't that basically say if you push the envelope of the rules, it means you're cheating? I mean, right. like, in, like you can't say he pushes the envelope, but he's not a cheater. It's like if they push the envelope, it means they're not within the confines of the rules. That's basically the inherent uh, you know definition of 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 it. It's like saying, well, he bends the rules. Well, that means he freaking doesn't play by the rules. Mm -hmm. Come on. If we can't say that Marcus Vitale is a cheater with his record, who can we call a cheater? Come on. <laughs> Only Navarro, because he's been indicted. Yes, yeah. Unless unless you're going to unless you get convicted in a federal trial, we can't right. officially call you a cheater. We'll just sprinkle in the allegedly, 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 allegedly. <laughs> All right, so that's gonna do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. Reminder to mark your calendars for the April Horses of Racing Age sale, which is on closing day of the Keeneland Spring Meet, which is Friday, April 29th. Entries open next Tuesday, March 1st. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Bob Hellringer, as well as Brian Sanfratello, our producer Patty Wolf, our associate producer Katie Petruniak, and our editors Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.